Okay, we are, we are going to get started. We need to keep to a uh, tight uh, time frame here because our keynoter has to catch a flight uh, late this morning and we don't want to short anyone on time. We don't want to short him on time or any people who have questions. Um, so we're going to just move right ahead. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Drexel and um, I am the director uh, of the Center for Journalism Ethics. Uh, having replaced a kind of irreplaceable guy, Stephen Ward, who started the whole thing uh, some six or so years ago, and we're glad is going to be with us today uh, as a participant. Um, so as I say, thank you for coming, and we've got a very, very busy day ahead of us. Mm -hmm. The topic, in a general sense, is, is really nothing new, because uh, there have been issues of uh, surveillance, uh, security, and certainly journalism and journalism ethics for a long, 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 long time. But of course, it's, it's also the case that uh, at least since 9-11, uh, we haven't seen anything quite like uh, the issues uh, that have emerged, um, both in kind and in degree, I would say. And of course, in the meantime, we've had technological developments, uh, we've had the uh, growth of new forms of media, the development of the concept of citizen journalism, uh, the ease of bypassing media altogether, um, and of course mega leaks such as the Snowden leaks and the Chelsea Manning Wiki WikiLeaks leaks, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, I think, as timely and important a topic as we could possibly have. And uh, I'm not going to say anything more about it other than in, a, in an instant to get out of the way and let things uh, start to roll. Uh, but I do have a couple of housekeeping things that I want to mention. One is for those of you who want to use a wireless connection, uh, select the UWNet uh, network and sign in as guest. That should get you uh, the wireless access that you need. If you need water, there are little water coolers in the back of the room that you can help yourself to. Of course, I think people already realize the coffee and, and a few rolls and so on over on the side. And should you need to charge any of your devices, uh, the best thing to do would be to go back to where the students are on our social media desk back there, and they've got some outlet strips and so on, and, and you can charge things up there. And uh, I suppose I should mention that um, Although our topic is surveillance, we will also all be under surveillance to some degree uh, today because this is being uh, live streamed and um, social media covered and recorded. So uh, welcome, glad to have you all here. And uh, my associate director, Katie Culver, will take over. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I'm delighted to welcome all of you. We're very happy that you're um, with us today. I'm up here to uh, bend the needle a little bit on the applause-o-meter um, to thank the people who made today possible. Uh, I know you're all very shy, but we're very, very grateful, so we'd like you to stand um, as I say your name, please. Uh, first of all, two people um, whose mind-blowing organizational skills <laughs> made even me look disorganized. I tend to be a little anal. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Rowan Calix from the School of Journalism and Lauren Simonis, who is leading, uh, an undergraduate, leading our uh, media team. Also in the back, one of the things we're most proud of this year um, in the Ethics Center is our addition of a student fellows program. Students have been more involved in the center this year than ever before. Uh, we have two fellows this year who have done remarkable work, especially on our ever-growing web presence. Uh, one of them is here now, another will be here at 10 o'clock. So Meredith, if you could stand up and be recognized for both you and Julia. Graduate student Wendy Swanberg gave us um, a great deal of help this year, bringing all of her sage advice from five years of running these conferences, and they've all been uh, one more excellent than the next. So thank you, Wendy. Where are you, Wendy? There you are. And her successor in that project assistant role um, is Dave Wilcox. And I have to say, uh, Dave brought tremendous skills, especially in, uh, with his marketing prowess, but also a terrific sense of humor as we battled all the bumps of this transitional year. No, stand back up. <laughs> 
Uh, shout out today for keeping me sane, or as sane as I can be. Um, you will see today coming in and out of the room um, uh, almost all of our colleagues from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. They can't all be here all day because we have things like teaching and research and committee work and all of that. But for those who are here, if you could please stand up. Luke, uh, yep. Sue, Jack, Hemet, yes. And in the back. You'll be seeing them coming and going, as I mentioned, and without their support, the center would never happen. I'd especially like to thank Greg Downey, who will be here later this afternoon, who, as director, has been a true champion of the center. Uh, one more internal thank you, again, someone who can't be here until about 10 o'clock, but Jennifer Carlson from the UW Foundation has been absolutely peerless in helping us find supporters and sponsors for the conference and all of our other activities, including the new fellows program. So I hope when you get a chance to see Jen, you will thank her on our behalf. Uh, speaking of those sponsors, uh, I'd like to go through them and thank them personally. Uh, the Gannett Foundation is our presenting sponsor today, ably represented here today by alum Owen Ullman. So Owen, if you could stand, please. And at the same table with Owen is Dave Zwiefel, who's here um, as one of our advisory board members, as an alum, and also a representative of the EVU Foundation, which is the sponsor of our William T. EVU keynote, um, which we will soon get to, I promise. So Dave, thank you to you as well. Programming today, including this, these awesome live feeds, which have drawn people from places far flung, and we're excited that, uh, that hopeful that we'll have an international presence today, is sponsored by the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, and um, that gift was stewarded by Brant Houston, and I'm not sure if Brant is here yet this morning, but he will be a little bit later. Um, and then also Ellen Foley. Ellen, are you here yet? I didn't see her walk in yet. But Ellen is with WPS Insurance and is also an alum of the um, journalism school, and she has... Um, been very, very helpful uh, as a sponsor as well. Tom Beer from WISC couldn't be here this morning. He's traveling for business. Um, he couldn't be here all day today. But we're very grateful to them for their sponsorship of the award that we named for Anthony Shadid, a very special friend of the center. We have longtime friends of the center here. Rick Featherston from American Family Insurance. Not, there he is. Hi, Rick. <laughs> Andy Hall from the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Hi, Andy. And Peppy O'Neill and Herman Bauman, if you could both please stand up. Thank you all so very much for your support and for making today possible. Um, I'd like our advisory board members to please stand. You're all clustered over there, I can see you. <laughs> I'm going to try to not get choked up on this one, but I just from the very bottom of my heart, have to thank you for all of the support and advice and time you give us. Uh, your dedication inspires me, but it also ignites me constantly. Um, you truly care about ethics and journalism in the public interest, and, and that's something that really matters. That brings me finally, I'm almost done, <laughs> that brings me finally uh, to two people um, whose vision set us on a course to where we are today, to what we've achieved this year, and I'm very proud of this year, and also to this tremendous conference that we're about to embark on. I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Jim Burgess, whose original gift and idea to um, support ethics and journalism set us on this path. So Jim, if you could please stand up. And I'd also like Stephen Ward to stand. In just five short years as the Jim Burgess um, Chair in Journalism Ethics, uh, Steve built a center um, and also that chair into something that's internationally recognized as something that's innovative. It's a voice for integrity. It's a voice for not just debate, but informed debate. It's always been a really important adjective to the two of us. So thank you very much. So before I turn uh, the mic over to my colleague, Steve Vaughn, who's going to set us off on our keynote, uh, I just want to say on a personal note, I could not possibly be more proud of my university, of its journalism school, or of this center. Um, this is a moment where our work matters more than it has ever mattered before. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm grateful to Bob for giving me the chance to continue in this role and excited to set sail with all of you. So again, thank you for being here, and I'll turn the mic over to Steve. Thank you, Katie, and uh, welcome, everybody, and good morning. Uh, as Bob said, uh, our topic uh, this year, surveillance, security, and journalism ethics, could not be more timely. 
And speaking as a historian, I fear that we sometimes take a too short of a view of this topic or this issue. We were fascinated by the latest revelations about the NSA. We all remember the Boston Bar Mar uh, Marathon bombing. And most of us in this room, I think, still vividly remember the terrible events of September the 11th, 2001, although some of my students now no longer have real sharp memories of that experience. That latter event really shows us that in our modern age, it is possible for a small group of people or even one person to gain weapons of, hold of weapons of mass destruction and kill perhaps thousands uh, of, of innocent people. But this issue of surveillance and privacy has a much longer history. And if we take a long view, it shows us that during the past century, some of the most grievous acts of terror that have been perpetrated on individuals have been by governments that have fallen into the hands of bad people, using the most sophisticated surveillance technology of the 1930s and 40s. The leaders of Nazi Germany and the former Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin murdered millions of their own citizens in the name of national security. It's important that we never allow that to happen in the United States. Now, I think there are a number of uh, deep-seated historical trends that have eroded privacy over the past century and a half. But I think three of them that are particularly relevant, I would just mention briefly. One of them is the rise of our concerns about national security. And this seems to have started particularly with World War I, which created an atmosphere of fear and suspicion. It lingered long after that into the 1920s and 30s. Most of you probably know that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI during that period uh, compile secret files on thousands of American citizens. Uh, the national security state then gained impetus during World War II and during the long Cold War with the former Soviet Union and then most recently uh, with the post 9-11 world. And it has also strengthened a culture of surveillance and made it seem more necessary and even inescapable. A second development I would suggest or submit challenging privacy has grown out of our own economic abundance since particularly the end of World War II. It's involved our reliance on things like credit cards and insurance companies, our fascination with tabloid and confessional journalism, and more recently with social media that have allowed advertisers to collect unprecedented amounts of private information about ourselves, much of which we divulge willingly. Uh, recently, for example, a T-Mobile customer received a CD with a file that had the metadata collected from his cell phone over the previous six months. The file contained almost 36,000 records, and it allowed the person who had that to track that person in minute detail, everywhere he traveled, he slept, he ate, his web searches, and much, much more. Finally, the third trend that I would mention is the rapid advances in technology that have made it easier to collect private information and also to challenge national security. And this is something that has accelerated and is likely to continue to accelerate into the future, and it's quite troubling. Uh, to me, I think there are three phases to this. Our modern concerns about privacy began to emerge in the late 19th century with the arrival of still photography, the movie camera, sound recording, and uh, the telephone. There was another revolution that came beginning with World War II and in the decades that followed that with the advent of magnetic tape recording, which made it much easier to spy on people, uh, satellite reconnaissance, television cameras, and perhaps most importantly, the computer. In 1958, the journalist Richard Rovere said that on any given day, there were literally hundreds of thousands of telephones that were being uh, in, uh, monitored by public and private investigators. And he also noted in 1958 that TV cameras were also being used in supermarkets and department stores to catch shop shoplifters. 1958 was the year we put up our first satellite, and he predicted someday we'll even be spied upon from outer space by TV cameras and satellites. Now, those privacy concerns came to a head during the water, in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal and the Vietnam War in the mid-1970s. And if many of you may remember, there were a number of very highly publicized congressional hearings. One of the most interesting was conducted by the Senate Judiciary Committee. And it investigated how things like computer databases and lie detectors and wiretapping and military surveillance uh, infringed on privacy. And it concluded that, in effect, that America found itself in a new world, and it was struggling to understand, quote, the shadowy forces threatening its uniqueness. 
At that time, there were about 30, excuse me, 85 federal agencies and more than almost 7,000 record keeping systems that had collected about 4 billion records on American citizens. And particularly distressing to these senators was the fact that these records had been put into computers, computer databases that made them much easier to uh, access. Now, in the mid-1970s, the computer was still a rather exotic piece of technology for most people. There were fewer than a quarter million computers in the United States. The personal computer had not been invented. And uh, so this is something that has, has uh, grown exponentially since that time. It wasn't just, though, the federal government that this in investigation was worried about. It, was, it also pointed out that private citizens increasingly had technology that allowed them to spy on their neighbors. And <clears throat> what, the what the committee concluded was that, at its worst, their findings revealed a country that was with, at war with its own traditions, a country that feared the logic of its own charter. Now, this was an issue that concerned both liberals and conservatives. The liberals warned that continued ignorance of surveillance technology could prove to be a, quote, Orwellian catastrophe for privacy and freedom. But conservatives, such as President Gerald Ford, was also worried about government encroachments through growing out of New Deal and great society programs. And he warned about a big brother bureaucracy. He told a law, uh, an audience at Stanford University's law school in 1975 that uh, privacy might be lost to, quote, a faceless set of digits in a monstrous network of computers, all instantly retrievable by anyone trained to push the right button. In many respects, this time of almost 40 years ago, uh, is a formative period for our thinking about privacy and national security. Our former Vice President Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, for example, were in the Ford administration during this period. They were very much a part of the debates over this issue during that time. But what's happened in the decades that have happened since the 1970s, I would submit, is yet another revolution that is of an entirely different magnitude to the revolutions that preceded it. You only need to consider the advances in satellite reconnaissance, DNA research, microprocessing, digitization, personal computers, the appearance of the internet, drone technology, uh, sophisticated social media such as e-readers, smartphones, Facebook, Twitter, Google Glasses, you could go on and on. So we're living in a much different world today than, than existed 40 years ago. We're fortunate today to have as our keynote speaker someone who has been reporting on the front lines of this issue, Eric Lischblau joined the New York Times in 2002 as the Washington correspondent covering the Justice Department for the paper's Washington Bureau. In 2006, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize along with James Risen for their articles on the George W. Bush administration's war and terror. The legal scholar Jeffrey Rosen called Mr. Lischfeld's 2008 book, Bush's War, the remaking of American Justice, quote, an inspiring example of reporters doing what they do best checking claims of unlimited governmental power and protecting the public's right to know. Please welcome Eric Lischbach. Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, Steve, and thanks to, uh, to Katie and to Bob for having me back uh, on campus. I was here a few, few years ago after my uh, book came out and, and uh, loved the whole experience, the, the back and forth, especially with uh, the students, I remember. Um, so this is, uh, is, is a great day to, uh, I'm sorry, let me just uh, get set up here. Um, it's a good day to be talking about ethics and journalism uh, because back in Washington, where I, where I work, uh, there is a, let's call it an ethically challenged event that everyone's getting ready for, which is the White House Correspondents' Dinner, some of you may have heard of. Uh, this is a, uh, is a somewhat embarrassing ritual. In fact, the New York Times, my paper, bans us from going to it because you have reporters uh, and editors basically schmoozing with and fawning over sources, politicians, celebrities, whoever the, the it person of the moment is, uh, and sort of for a day abdicating our usual role uh, as, as reporters and skeptics and instead uh, reinforcing the worst uh, stereotypes people have of reporters, which is that we are cozying up to sources and we're afraid to ask them tough questions. Uh, so instead of being back in Washington and uh, perhaps having drinks with Kim Kardashian or Donald Trump or 
who knows, maybe even Donald Sterling. We are here today standing up for ethics and journalism, so I want to hear, hear a, uh, a bi big uh, applause for that. Thank you. Our, our timing uh, is also good for discussing ethics and journalism because just a few weeks ago, as you know, the Pulitzers came out. And the, uh, the one that got the most attention, the highest honor for public service, went to The Guardian and The Washington Post for uh, their stories as a result of the Edward Snowden leaks on NSA, as Steve talked about, the, uh, the kind of surveillance state that's been created since 9-11. Um, and this was uh, a high mark for journalists, but as, uh, as one might expect, on the other side, there was quite a bit of debate and criticism. Uh, Representative uh, Pete, um, I'm sorry, Pete King from uh, New York, he called this a disgraceful honor. And he said, he, he discussed the, uh, the reporters from The Guardian and The Post in criminal terms. He said they were enablers of a criminal, in this case, Edward Snowden, uh, and they had uh, facilitated and re uh, illegal conduct, and the Pulitzer Board was rewarding illegal conduct. Now, these are, these are serious charges. He's sort of describing us in terms of, of being co-conspirators, which was actually a, uh, in another case, was a term that the Justice Department used in describing a reporter. A and it really uh, kind of showcases the, the adversarial relationship that's developed, especially since 9-11, between reporters and the establishment and how we go about covering uh, national security matters. Uh, for me, the, the criticism from, uh, from King was kind of deja vu from, uh, from our 2006 experience with the Bush wiretapping program. After we won our Pulitzer uh, with, with, with Jim Rice and my partner, uh, we were also criticized, and not just by Pete King. He, he, was, he was sort of a nobody. We, we got criticized from the top by Bush and Cheney, and I won't try and do my Cheney imitation, but picture John Stewart, if you can, doing his Cheney with the upturned, uh, upturned mouth. Uh, and what Cheney said was that we were helping Al-Qaeda. Uh, he also used the word disgrace in describing our Pulitzer and, and the fact that uh, we had been honored um, and said that uh, he was very critical of both the NSA story and another big story we had after that on a, uh, a program that allowed the CIA to sift through millions of bank records um, along with phone surveillance. This was a financial record surveillance to try and find uh, financial transactions might be linked to Al-Qaeda. And what Cheney said was, some of the press, in particular the New York Times, have made the job of defending against further terrorist attacks more difficult by insisting on publishing detailed information about vital national security programs. And he said that being awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Outstanding Journalism, I think that is a disgrace. Now, the, the White House spokesman at the time, uh, who was Tony Snow, actually put this, I thought, in a fairly, um, fairly reasoned way, considering some of the other rhetoric that was out there. He said, the New York Times and other news organizations ought to think long and hard about whether a public's right to know, in some cases, might overwrite somebody's right to live. Now, I, I would disagree with whether or not our story ever compromised anyone's right to live. I think all the evidence since then, and the fact that, that there were no um, uh, there, there was no direct result in terms of damage that was caused by that story show that we didn't compromise anyone's right to live. But I think that Snow was right in, in putting this as sort of a balancing test, which is something the courts have also wrestled with. Um, it should not be a de facto uh, uh, case of national security information, classified information should not be published. It has to be balanced against the public's right to know and how much is there to be learned from public scrutiny and providing a check on, on government power and abuse. Um, I think that if it were up to the Pete Kings, we in the media would not publish any classified information. What you hear from, uh, from King and Cheney and others is, um, you know, what gives the New York Times the right to decide what should be declassified? And uh, I would answer that the, that, that the First Amendment gives us that right, that we have a long, proud tradition of a robust press uh, sort of watching the watchdogs, policing the police, and we do not have uh, a, an official secrets act the way Britain and some other countries do. It is not illegal, despite what, what some conservatives might want you to believe, for the media to publish classified information. There's some who would like it to be, but we still have uh, the right, and I would argue the responsibility, to, uh, to be aggressive in reporting on national security matters, even classified matters. Now, part of, part of my view on this comes to the fact that we've seen just a ridiculous overclassification of documents. Um, and uh, just to point to a few examples on that, uh, we have uh, right now going on in Washington 
the uh, debate over a so-called torture report. This is a, I believe, 7,000 plus page report into the CIA's tactics after 9-11 and using waterboarding and other means of so-called enhanced interrogation techniques uh, to get information out of, out of Al-Qaeda suspects. Um, this report has been bottled up for years, even though it has uh, fairly important historic information about not only what methods were used, but uh, their efficacy, did, the, did they in fact produce usable intelligence, and also what the CIA was telling to, not just to the public, forget about that, but, but to the White House and to national security officials, were they misleading them? Their findings reportedly uh, in, the, in this document that say that the CIA was lying essentially to the White House about, uh, about the information. Now, this report remains classified. It's still up in the air whether it'll ever be declassified. Hopefully it will be. Um, but I think that, that if and when it does come out, what will be clear is that most of the information in it is not compromising to national security in the sense of compromising what the CIA likes to call sources and methods, but rather the material is politically damaging and legally damaging. And the reason for keeping it bottled up uh, is not to protect the country, but to protect the CIA in this case. Uh, and you can translate that to protecting the NSA in the case of Snowden secrets and things like that. Um, and the examples of sort of what I would call ridiculous knee-jerk over, overclassification go, go well beyond uh, sort of a modern-day issue like torture. I, I'm, uh, I've been on book leave for most of the last year. I just came back to the paper a few weeks ago, I'm writing a book on the Nazis who, uh, who got into America after the war, thousands of them. Uh, who settled in America, sometimes with the help of the CIA and the FBI. Uh, and I've spent uh, a lot of time up in the National Archives outside Washington and College Park going through files. Many of them, luckily, were declassified files <coughs> about the CIA's relationship with these Nazis um, and the fact that the CIA was using a lot of these people as anti-Soviet spies and moles, um, even knowing their, the atrocities they were involved in, knowing that they were with the SS, knowing they worked in concentration camps, they were still not only using these guys, in some cases protecting them from prosecution and deportation. Um, and yet, and yet going through these files, you will even today, if you go to College Park, you will see dozens of files that have been pulled by the CIA because they still are regarded as classified. Now think about that for a moment. These are files from the 1950s mostly, some of them in the late 40s. So going back, you know, 60 years, that talk about the CIA's complicit role with Nazis, with Nazis and Nazi collaborators, and yet those materials, 60 years later, still remain classified. You can go, there's a, there's a, uh, a guy who lived in Albany uh, uh, beginning in the, in the 1950s, um, who was a, a Latvian Nazi collaborator, who was the guy in charge of going into the Jewish ghettos and picking out the Jews who would be sent to the concentration camps. Uh, and he went to work for the CIA when he moved into America. Uh, they, they helped him, they, uh, they used him as a as sort of a Latvian spy in, in first in Europe and then in the US. You go into his file in College Park right now and you will see seven folders. Each one has one page in it saying that the material in that folder, which talks about this guy's role with the CIA, has been, de has been classified, in fact reclassified. It was declassified and then it was reclassified. So my point, and forgive me if I go on a little bit long about Nazis, I'm kind of in a Nazi state of mind these, these, these last few months. Um, my, my, my point is that even the most ridiculous and, and, and historic materials still remain classified. Um, and I think that when, when the government says this is classified, I think it is the, the media's responsibility to push back and say, first of all, why is it classified? And second of all, is there any part of this that could be, um, uh, that, that should be and could be uh, open to public scrutiny. Now, I think if you, if you looked at all the stories since 9-11, and Steve mentioned uh, a number of them, but uh, all the stories 9-11 that relied in some way on classified information that the government didn't want out there, they are the historic stories of our times. They're stories about, uh, about the enhanced interrogation techniques. They're stories about wiretapping and surveillance. They're stories about um, extraordinary renditions and sending guys to other countries where they were almost certainly tortured. Uh, there are recent stories about cyber attacks, offensive cyber attacks by the U.S. There are stories about drones. Now think about for a second if the media was not pushing back, was not, uh, was not aggressively reporting on these things, how much, how much poorer we would be as, as Americans in a democracy uh, for all the information we, we would not know about? And is that the kind of culture that we want to live in? Now that said, I think that we in the media do have an ethical obligation to, uh, to be careful about what we report when it comes to national security. 
there are cases. I, I, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where the line is, but you know, we in the media, despite what some of our critics might want you to think, you know, are not looking to expose uh, operations that could get Americans killed, that could get sources killed. And I think there are any number of recent examples uh, that, that highlight this. In the case of our, of our NSA story in 2005 and the Bush eavesdropping program, the New York Times decided to hold that story at the request of the White House for 13 months. Um, that is not, in my mind, a, a, a reckless uh, newspaper that's, that's looking to out national security secrets no matter what. Um, that was a decision by the editors. I, I, I happen to disagree with that decision, but that was a decision made because they believed at, at, at the persuasion of the White House that this could compromise national security information. Now, in that case, um, events later on would show that we were actively misled by the White House about the, the truth of the program and, and, and uh, both its effectiveness and the legal, legal debate over it. Uh, which again go goes to the point of, of uh, the danger of always trusting what the government tells you when it comes to national security matters. But again, that was a story that we held for 13 months, not exactly a reckless news organization. Um, one of the stories you're honoring today from the AP, uh, they held for I think more than three years involving uh, an American in Iran um, and uh, who, who the CIA was, was trying to get out of Iran. Uh, and the, the, go the government, the CIA, and I believe the White House, you know, had asked that they be given more time to try and get this guy out. And the AP held off for more than three years. Again, not exactly a reckless news decision. Um, in the case of WikiLeaks, which I also worked on a few years ago, the, the Bradley Manning documents that came out, um, I worked on a lot of the, uh, the State Department cables. These were classified State Department cables that told us a lot about privately what the government thought. You know, publicly you, you, you have the, the talking points in the State Department about, uh, for instance, I wrote about Saudi Arabia and, and what they're doing to finance terrorism secretly. You have the public talking points and they have privately what the government really thinks. Um, now, we plowed through those documents. We had a whole team of people going through them. But we were very careful to look at, again, the sources and methods to delete the names of sources who might be put in a compromising position, perhaps an agent of the U.S. that, that had not, not been outed. Um, now this gets to a difficult issue because in that case you had WikiLeaks um, and, and you had uh, Assange who was ready to put out really just anything. Um, he did not have kind of that self-censor in place. Uh, you know, he, he's a believer in, in freedom of information to, to the nth degree and that does raise a lot of difficult questions, and I'm not sure what the answer is when in, in this day and age of uh, you know, access to the internet where anyone can get out information um, you know, in a split second and is not willing to put in place those sort of internal safeguards, I'm not sure how you, how you deal with that. Um, you know, in, in what the mainstream media, is, as, as Sarah Palin would like to call us, uh, you know, I, I think that there are sort of traditions and safeguards and, and policies in place, uh, whether it's the New York Times or the Washington Post or, or AP or any other news organization, you know, that we generally abide by, where we're gonna look to see, okay, is this information that could pose some specific threat? And, and, and we're, we are gonna censor ourselves. Um, you know, Assange or, or, or Bradley Manning or people who can put stuff up instantly, citizen journalists, if you will, uh, they bring a lot to the table. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing that. Obviously, we, we've, you know, we've profited from the material in terms of good stories being put out. But there is a danger, and I, I don't know what the, what the answer to that is, and I think that that's something that's, that's really worth a, a much closer look. Um, so uh, the, the question is, um, when, when do we publish and when do we, uh, when do we sit on a story? In the case of the NSA uh, story, again, coming back to that, there was specific information in that story that we agreed to hold back because we could at least see the White House's argument that, okay, that particular piece of information could conceivably uh, give Al-Qaeda uh, or, or, its, or its affiliates information that they might not have known before. So we are, again, are in a position of, of censoring ourselves, but it comes back to the question of who do you want making those decisions? Do you want the government making the decisions or do you want the media making the decisions? As, as, a, as a reporter, obviously, I lean towards the, towards the media making those decisions because there's been so many instances from the Pentagon Papers on down where the government has simply you know, misled us, has covered up material not that, not that was uh, sensitive to national security, but was simply damaging politically or embarrassing politically. Um, and, and their motives have to be looked at very, very closely. Um, 
when the Obama, Obama administration came into office, uh, I, I think there was a general hope within the media that, that some of the, the real uh, adversarial positions that had, had taken root after 9-11 with the Bush administration might dissipate a little bit. In fact, uh, Obama himself said that he was, was going to run the most transparent administration in history. This was one of his first big pledges to run uh, uh, the, the most open government in history uh, when it came to declassifying information, putting things out in response to Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, making the rationale for decisions public, things like that. He was going to be the trendsetter. Um, sadly, I, I think uh, in the last five years, we have not seen that. Um, there, there's been, I'd say, a, li a little bit of progress on things like Freedom of Information Act requests. They're a little better. It's that, you know, you don't have to wait two years for, for things the way you used to. But uh, the, the, the main uh, uh, really surprising development we've seen from the Obama administration is the aggressiveness which, with, with which the Justice Department has pursued leak investigations, which has really had a chilling effect on, on reporters in Washington. Um, the administration has pursued more leak prosecutions than any other administration before it. Uh, and a number of those cases really were, were quite flimsy. One, one that I would mention is the case of Tom Drake, who was an NSA whistleblower, uh, originally charged with, uh, I believe, 35 felony counts that would have put him away in prison for years and years. Uh, those were ultimately reduced to a single misdemeanor. He did no jail time. Really what he was trying to expose was not national security secret, secrets, but financial boondoggles and waste and corruption within the NSA. Uh, but the Obama administration came after him very, very hard uh, and very aggressively. And in the end, they, they ended up uh, dismissing almost their entire case. And there have been a number of these where, where the administration, somewhat to the surprise of, of media and media watchdog groups, ha has really um, come after the, the, both the media itself and, uh, and the sources that we rely on. And, and that has been troubling. Unfortunately, we do not, uh, we've not been successful in getting a shield law at the federal level. Almost every state at this point has some shield law that protects the confidentiality, that, that, that recognizes and respects the confidentiality between a reporter and a source. Um, in fact, when I was in California, um, I was, uh, someone tried to find out the, the source of information in a legal case, and I had to take the stand, and, and I was able to say, I'm not going to disclose that because it was a confidential relationship, and the judge said, okay, be on your way. We don't have that at the federal level. Uh, we um, have been trying for several years, but unfortunately, there, there is this, this pushback, this strong pushback that this would compromise national security secrets, and so... Uh, my partner, Jim Risen, is now facing a contempt citation um, that, that will probably go to the Supreme Court fairly soon. Could be looking at the decision, does he go to jail or does he, uh, does he out a source? Now, knowing Jim, I know that he will not out that source. This had to do with uh, a story that he put in his book about a botched CIA program in Iran uh, and about the bungling of uh, intelligence that, in fact, told the Iranians more than they knew before. Uh, about, uh, uh, about U.S. nuclear programs and, and what the U.S. knew about Iranian nuclear programs. Um, <clears throat> but he will face the very, very difficult situation of deciding, does he go to jail for this important principle? Um, hopefully we'll come to that. But just looking around my office uh, at, at the New York Times and the Washington Bureau, everyone who covers national security sort of has their own unique story uh, about this dilemma. Um, Scott Shane, uh, one of our best national security reporters, he got dragged into a criminal case because of another leak prosecution involving a CIA officer who um, had allegedly uh, identified by name, although there's some dispute, dispute about that, CIA officers. So Scott became the uh, sort of a, a, an unfortunate participant in a criminal prosecution, which no reporter likes to be. Uh, my own situation, with, again, with the NSA story, for years I was under threat of subpoena uh, to reveal the sources of that story, which, of course, we were not willing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I know there were people who I dealt with who, who went through, you know, a lot of personal hardship. The, the most difficult experience for me was a, a close personal friend um, who worked at the CIA at that time, who I can say had absolutely nothing to do with the story, but by virtue of his friendship with me, was interrogated for stretches of eight hours, day after, <laughs> over a period of three or four days, um, and ultimately was given sort of the, the, the draconian ultimatum that he either uh, stop communicating with me, 
and end his relationship with me or lose his security clearance and leave the CIA. And I think to this guy's credit, he took quite a, quite a bold stance. He left the CIA. He said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna play by those rules. That's not the kind of place where I wanna live. So there, there are you know, personal hardships, serious hardships that are, um, that are left in the wake of these prosecutions. You know, the, sort of the joke in, in Washington among the reporters do this kind of stuff. You call someone up and say, hey, can we meet for coffee? You know, talk about X, Y, or Z. They'll say, you know, yeah, does that come with a subpoena? And, and, and they're only half joking. You know, this is sort of a gallows humor because you know that if, you, uh, if you're a source or if you're a reporter who works in a certain area of coverage, you are very likely to become, uh, to become entangled in a leak investigation. And this, has to, this also gets to, as, as Steve was saying, the, the tremendous inroads in, in, in technology uh, that the NSA has made in terms of surveillance. You know, we now know that, that our, but the phone logs are routinely, um, uh, routinely scrubbed by, uh, by the Justice Department in certain cases. You know, so they know exactly who we're calling. They know who we're emailing with. Um, they can get those ver very easily, and so there is there's undoubtedly a risk. Um, but I think that the the confidential sources that we rely on are are integral to what we do in terms of national security reporting. You know, in other areas of reporting, it it, it would be nice to think that we can be as transparent as possible. Uh, you know, that our motives would be above board. You know, that that we can. Uh, we can say exactly who we talked to, that, that we can faithfully report everything that they told us, that, that there are no biases, there are no conflicts, et cetera, et cetera. In national security, though, the relationship with the source is difficult because these are people who are putting themselves at some risk, and we cannot be as transparent as we would like to be. I, I know that that's a bit ironic since I was just blasting the Obama administration for the lack of transparency, but, um, you know, the... the the confidential relationship with anonymous sources is, is integral, again, to what we do. There, there was a bit of a backlash uh, 10 years or so ago after the Jason Blair scandal at the Times. Um, you know, anonymous sources were verboten in a lot of places. You know, USA Today banned them all together. We uh, scaled them back uh, quite a bit. And I think there was a lot lost, especially in the area of national security reporting, because any anonymous source had become so suspect and so um, uh, immediately dubious that there were reported, there were stories out there that just could not get reported, and, and this was a critical period. We're talking in 2003, 2004, 2005, when a lot of the things we now know post 9/11 were going on in the way of torture and wiretapping and things like that. Those stories became or those are uh, tough to get at to begin with uh, because they, these are classified, but they became even tougher to get at in that time period. And I think I think was one reason why we were slow to recognize a lot of what was going on. Um, because, because of that, that skittishness after Jason Blair to use confidential sources. And, and I just, just one last point on that. I, I, I don't want people to be misled into thinking that, you know, the stuff that we're trying to get out here is all sort of so civil liberties and privacy and feel-good liberal issues, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, some of this is, you know, is law and order stuff, what, 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 the, what conservatives, what Pete King would consider to be, you know, keeping the country safe, like after 9-11, being able to examine how, how it was that the, the U.S. government missed all the warning signs. The, as George Tenet said, the, the, the lights blinking red. How was it that we missed that stuff? Uh, and you know, there, were, there were stories involving classified material that came out. One of the more famous ones was uh, uh, NSA uh, uh, wiretaps that were not translated until days later, uh, saying that uh, on, on September 10th, uh, 2001, that the match begins tomorrow, I think, or something like that, and uh, things along those lines. Now, those were classified. Uh, if the media had not been able to report on those things, which, which we did, and there was a leak investigation into that, if I recall right, um, you know, we would have had much less insight into how it was that the warning signs were missed before 9-11. So these, these are law and order issues. These are keeping the country safe issues, because again, we have to be the check on the government in terms of, of watching them and being able to, to hold them up to scrutiny. Um, so I guess the, the, the bottom line is that uh, I think there is this, this tension in the last 13 years since 9-11 that we've, that we've really seen to, to an unprecedented degree between what the media does in national security and what the government wants us to do. And I think if, if we abdicate that responsibility, if we allow the government to, to dictate the terms, uh, we'll be a lot, a lot poorer for it. So, thank you. And I think we're taking questions. Or, yeah. Uh, we have some time for questions, and Eric has a plane set to leave at 10:15. I think.
Uh, sure, that's, that's, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, I'm wondering, given the kinds of legal constraints you've been talking about, what the role of foreign newspapers and foreign uh, broadcasting systems would be. Uh, uh, again, uh, the kinds of reporting we're getting from the BBC, from The Guardian, about what's happening in the United States, the kinds of sources that they can perhaps attract, uh, and the kinds of reporting they can uh, uh, support, for example, the Greg Palace and, and other reporters mm -hmm. who have drifted across the pond. Right, right. Well, I, I think it cuts both ways. I mean, the, the, uh, the other side of that is that Britain, because of some of their stricter laws, we ta I talked about, the, uh, uh, about their, their secrets laws, uh, in a couple of situations, the Times had to, uh, had to keep certain information about Brit British uh, surveillance out of our, uh, the International Herald Tribune. Uh, now, that's a rare situation, but so it cuts both ways. Uh, but, but we have certainly, uh, luckily, had, had a good partnership, especially with The Guardian, first in the, in the WikiLeaks case, where um, they were kind of the, 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 the first ones in on that, and also in the, in the Snowden stuff. So I think that uh, it does sort of allow a, a uh, almost a pool coverage, if you will, of some of these big issues. Um, there, there's still a competition, and, and we in the media, you know, are sort of driven by getting the scoop ahead of the other guy. But, um, you know, especially, especially in England and with The Guardian, uh, I think we have seen better overall reporting because of it. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. I was wondering, how, how conflicted do you think uh, reporters are in Washington about um, asserting our position on, um, on the fact that, you know, what you, your speech was great, and I'm wondering whether we should be perhaps a little bit more assertive about our position as reporters Right, right. No, I mean, that's a good point because because we, uh, as reporters, you know, we're always taught to uh, go down the middle. You don't you don't uh, reveal biases or your own personal opinions. But but I think this is sort of the exception because it's our it's our bread and butter. It's our livelihood. And y you know, yes, I, I think we can be you know unabashed advocates for openness and transparency in government. I, I you know I'd argue that that's the one area where. Yeah, where it's okay for reporters to say, yes, we, we, we believe that more should be put out there, we believe that there should be fewer leak investigations. So I think it's okay to show our biases in that, in that case because it's, it's what we do. Uh, every uh, reporter, it's kind of a basic skill set. When, when you talk to a source, the source is talking to you for a reason and you have to sort out what's an agenda and what's, uh, what's legitimate, what's the truth. Um, how did that come into play with the Snowden thing? Because you have Snowden who, who has an agenda, you have the, the, the government folks who have their own agenda in terms of telling you what not to publish. Was it as simple as the things that we do every day in evaluating sources? Can you take us inside that, uh, that thought process a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, Snowden was such an unusual case, I, I guess, primarily because you had the source becoming so public. Um, and, and outing himself so quickly within, I think it was maybe five or six days of the original stories uh, coming out, first in The Guardian and then The Post, you had uh, Snowden um, giving an interview, I think, I think the first interview was to The Guardian, you know, saying, hey, I was a source, you know, I was the guy who, I forget if he gave the details, but, but you know, essentially I was the guy who downloaded uh, four laptops worth of information, and now I'm going off to China, and then I'm going off to Russia. You know, that, that's an unusual case. Confidential sources usually stay confidential. A and I have sort of mixed feelings about the impact of all that, because Snowden really became the story uh, in some ways. As, as much the, the important information he revealed was Snowden himself and, and sort of has martyred himself. So his, his own you know, agenda is on, is on full display. I, I'd like to think that when we're dealing with confidential sources, we we can um, you know we can judge the agenda and can sort of, this sounds strange but can sort of rein them in you know it does you, you, you know it's the, the the tail wagging the dog in the case of Snowden where he has his own agenda clearly and he can sort of dictate the terms of the story and that that does put us I think in a in a somewhat uncomfortable situation um, and uh, um, you know the, the, I think there are um, you know checks that we have to put on ourselves to 
you know, to, to prevent ourselves from being manipulated. Now, this was, as I say, an extraordinary case where, uh, you, you know, just the, the reams and reams of information he put out and the, may, the way he made himself so central to the story, he was able to set the agenda, for better or worse. Yes. So you asserted that the media are better able to determine what should, in effect, be declassified than the government is. A, I wonder if you believe that literally for the media in a plural sense, from the New York Times down to the single blogger on the, on the corner, and, and B, what is the ethical underpinning for that assertion? Why is the elected government less accountable than the for-profit media? Sure, uh, that's certainly the, 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 the countervailing viewpoint that, that you hear, as I said, from the Pete Kings and, and Vice President Cheney and, and others, which is who elected the New York Times. Um, there is this inherent tension. Um, I guess, w you know, we are ultimately accountable, uh, you know, to the public in a way that the government does not, because since the government, uh, as strange as that sounds, the government will keep everything in this black box. So we, we don't, we, it, it's impossible for the public to, to fully scrutinize what the government is doing when it comes to these national security uh, situations. Whereas the, the press is putting it all out there. You know, we, we publish what we know and what we find out um, as, as best we can, so long as it does not, in our view, uh, you know, provide threatening or compromising information. This is a difficult balance, but it comes back to what I was saying earlier, that, that I think uh, case after case will show that the government will hide what they don't want out there, not for national security reasons, reasons but for reasons of political embarrassment and legal jeopardy. Um, and if we don't have the media pushing back on that, uh, just think of all the stories you would know nothing about as we're sitting here. Well, that's that's why I ra raised the, the you know the, the difficult question with someone like Assange um, that it is a new landscape. I, I, am I confident the bloggers can make those decisions? No, no, I'm not confident that bloggers can make those decisions, uh, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how you kind of integrate these citizen journalists into into the mainstream. I, I think you know the barn doors sort of opened already with with Snowden on on that uh, with Snowden and Manning where it is so much easier for someone to put something out themselves and reach, reach a mass audience. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, certainly the, the government's answer is, is the increase in leak prosecutions. That, that's been their answer because they clearly don't, uh, they don't want the public in a position to uh, be able to make those decisions. They want to make them themselves. So there, there's this inherent tension and I don't know what the answer is to kind of the, the, low level, the lower level bloggers. The, um Yes. Oh, I guess I'm next. Hi. Um, it would seem that from an ethical perspective, this is a case of minimizing harm. You're leaning, leaning towards an open society, free press, but you have some cases of harm doing that you want to uh, at least not do harm or restrict it. In this case, national security, I don't think it's a case of doing no harm. In many of these cases, some harm will be done, but even if it's embarrassment of foreign policy and things like this. My problem is what I would call uh, epistemic. A matter of knowledge. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Yeah, a, a matter of, a, in many, I'll get right to my question. In many cases, can reporters know with any certainty what the consequences of publishing something is? Is it just a guess, a hunch, a likely probability? How do you, take me through your process if you get into a case where in fact where you don't know what the consequences are. Do you back off and say we don't know the consequences so we don't publish or you do you take a leap of faith? Well, I, I think one way and probably the central way that we try and find that out is to go to the government, is to say to them, look, this is what we are preparing to publish. And, and that's one key way, probably the key way, that, that we differ from, again, the, the individual blogger, someone who's just willing to put whatever out, is out there. Uh, in a number of cases, um, you know, we've had, we've had bloggers who, who may get sensitive information who say, why should I bother to go to the government? I'm, I, you know, I'm just going to put this out there. I don't care what they say, what their response is. You know, we, uh, again, in the traditional media, um, there is an obligation, we feel, to not only go to them to get their response for publication of the story, but to say, okay, here, here's, here is this potentially sensitive information. Tell us 
um, you know, if you want to make a case as to why you don't think this should be published, this is your chance. And that's happened over and over again with, with WikiLeaks, um, with, uh, with elements of uh, uh, the Snowden coverage, with post 9-11 post stuff. And often they have made the case and we have perhaps kept out certain discrete pieces of information. You're not going to kill the whole story in most of these cases, but even though they ask you to, but you may keep out discrete pieces of information. You know, we talked about the, the AP holding a story for more than three years. I mean, again, I think that that, that is, as strongly as anything else says that the media does censor itself and is, is uh, you know, sensitive to these concerns. Now, can we ever know for certain that, uh, you know, that there will be no harm? No, but I don't think the government can either, and I think it does have to be a balancing test. Uh, you know, I know that early on in, with our NSA story, there was one editor who said that, you know, if there was a chance that public, publishing the story was going to uh, lead to the loss of a single American's life, we would not publish the story. Now, that's, that bar is so high that, that there are so many stories you could not publish because conceivably, theoretically, you could see a case where it might compromise public, secure, uh, public safety and national security. I, I think it does have to be a balancing test and the, the, our presumption has to be to publish unless there is a clear and specific reason not to publish. Uh, again, coming back to the AP story where you had, uh, where, where you had an American whose life was, was in some jeopardy rather than you know, a theoretical concern that, well, you know, we might be telling, the, what you usually hear is, we'll be telling the bad guys stuff that they, they don't already know. Well, in most of these cases, they do already know that, first of all. Uh, but, you know, that's such a, a uh, kind of abstract theoretical concern that I, I don't know how you would do national security reporting if you use that rubric. Yes. Okay. How, how widespread amongst the media are national security clearances and how useful is that? Does that give you an edge over other reporters? Oh, we, we don't have, reporters don't have national security clearance. Is that, is that your question? Well, as, as prior background, a number of reporters have come from like uh, Bob Woodward, Naval Intelligence, uh, uh, Ben Bradley, CIA. Uh, a is lot ben of, Bradley uh, the CIA? there are a lot of uh, okay. people in the national media with former intelligence agency backgrounds. I just wonder how widespread that is. I don't, I don't that think is. that happens very often. I mean, what, you know, Woodward was in naval intelligence, you know, ye, uh, some years before, and I've never heard that that his security clearance. It certainly wasn't active at the time he was doing that. I, I, that's uh, I'm not aware of that situation coming up. I mean, re reporters certainly don't have uh, security clearance. We'd be the last people that they, they, they would give them to, uh, and. You know, maybe you could count on one hand the number of people who have come from that background and gone into the media, and even then, I don't, I don't know that it would have. Uh, the only case I, c I can think of um, uh, is uh, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Um, the uh, NSA uh, writer wrote the Purple Power. Help me out here. Um, uh, Jim Bamford, Jim Bamford. That, that, that's the one case where he actually did work in intelligence, and so some of his critics, after he published uh, a number of, of very hard-hitting stories, said, well, you know, you, you uh, used your national security clearance. Now, he, he said, no, I didn't use anything that I, I knew years and years before. I, I'm a reporter, and I did reporting. So, I mean, I think the, the impact of, of national security clearance is zero to, to almost zero. Yes. So we have, question, we have a question from someone who's not here <laughs> that I'm happy to relate to, and which is, can you please expand on the chilling effect? How does the threat of subpoena affect your reporting? Do you think twice about what you write? Are we talking about a delay in covering stories or simply not covering stories as a whole? And then what are the implications of that? Well, I, I think we, we do think twice. I mean, I, I'd like to think that, that uh, at the Times and, and uh, friends at, at other papers and networks, you know, we, we are not going to be so hesitant that we are not going to simply not wade into sensitive territory. I mean, I, I, I think that, that there is a, a backbone in the industry that says 
you know, we are, we are not going to be sort of kowtowed into just not even looking into certain areas, and, and that's, that's seen in the stories that have come out, uh, you know, drones and, and, uh, and torture and wiretapping and things like that. I mean, I think the, the, the proof is, is in the publication of these um, uh, fairly sensitive stories. Yes? <laughs> Journalists or reporters specifically can be unabashed advocates of openness and transparency in government. I may get in trouble for that, but yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, because when I've asked uh, you know, AP reporters in DC and other people about uh, some of these issues, they say, no, we have to put it right down the line. This comes up in a very self-interested way. The House of Representatives passed a FOIA Reform Act back in February unanimously, 410 to 0. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would essentially uh, statutorily support what the administration has suggested for reforming FOIA. Um, and the Senate's considering it, Leahy is talking about it, but I noticed the New York Times didn't cover the law, the editorial board hasn't uh, weighed in, um, and I don't think any other major network or paper has either, mm. uh, but it makes a tremendous amount of sense for every single journalist in the country to say to the Senate, pass for reform, right, and right. maybe extend it uh, as well. I mean, but this, this is a, generally thought of as a good law, and yet it's not showing up in the papers, so there's really no political or media pressure upon the Senate to put this bill through. And I'm wondering if it's okay I, I to gotta admit, I guess proving your point, I wasn't even aware of the February vote, so uh, I, I've been off chasing Nazis, so that's my excuse, but. but uh, <laughs> okay. it's HR 1211, if you wanna look it up. Right, uh, I, I don't know what the, that, that seems like an issue that we would normally, the, the editorial side of the, of the newsroom would certainly speak out on, I know they have in similar situations. Um, you know, it seems like something the paper, I mean, I, you, you, that, that's one, do you, do you uh, kind of lower the bar on what's a news story? There are votes in Congress all the time that we don't cover. I, I would argue, yeah, that, that, that maybe if, if there were a comparable story that we might not cover, that's one we should cover. Um, just because it does affect, you know, the, w the way we do business and kind of the open society that we live in. I, I, I'll, I'll check it out. I was, wasn't even aware of that, so. Uh, when we're uh, performing our calculus on whether the disclosure, uh, w whether the risk would outweigh the value of the disclosure, and in good faith when we approach the government and say, what is your, what would be your specific concern if we were to publish X, Y, and Z, uh, in your experience, how quickly does the leaks investigation begin? <laughs> Um, very quick. I mean, some, sometimes they, they've started even even before we've gone to them because they, they're, they're expecting our call. They know that we've talked to people, and so they're they're are, they're already up and up and running. Um, you know, again, coming back to the the NSA story in 2005. I mean, they, there they were. You, you know, they had at one point 25 FBI agents working on a leak investigation, and and uh, within a matter of months, uh, and they were you know, scour in the town. Um, so that, that was, I think, an unusual case, but, but even in, you know, even in, in kind of not quite so high profile stories, they, they, are, they seem to be aggressively, uh, aggressively pursuing this stuff very, very quickly. Well, how, how does that cover the interaction uh, for, for a news organization going to the government and, and again, in good faith, you know, wanting to make a sort of an ethical decision at the same time knowing that, you know, inevitably and sort of imminently there's going to be this criminal inquiry that's going to have really severe consequences for the news organization. Right, no, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think we've let it affect us because we just feel like that, that, that need to go to the government and give them their say and give them their chance, you know, is kind of overriding, so you just, you just roll with it, I think. Yes. Hey, um, I guess when you have an anonymous source with a story, I guess how skeptical do you have to be of that story and where do you draw the line on whether to run with it, whether to fact check? How skeptical do you have to be, and I missed the end of it, I'm sorry. How skeptical do you have to be um, about that story? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, especially when you're not naming someone who, who's not out there publicly, you, you do have to be extra cautious about, uh, about their own agenda. I, I guess that um, you know where 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 I think we draw the line I is that you allow confidential sources, at least on national security matters, and I'd say across the board, to to um, give you factual information. Such and such happened. There is such and such a report. Here is this report. Um, you know, not to just sort of color and taint the story with whatever their opinions are. Uh, and, and so you're, you're using them to, 
uh, and going back to them, to get factual information where their agenda is sort of less important. Okay, if, if such and such happened, um, you know, and I can corroborate that it's true, the, the agenda may not matter. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I've been in, a, in situations, actually a number of times on national security stories, where people were confirming things that they didn't want me to publish, uh, which is sort of an odd position. Uh, on the one hand saying, well, yes, this is true, what you're asking me, but no, you shouldn't publish it for this reason. So, you know, their agendas, I, I think when you're dealing with, you know, very fact-based reporting, their agendas become less significant, I think. Going back to your comment about the difficulty of where the citizen journalists fit into this balancing question, right. isn't that one of the dangers with the Federal Shield Law, that we'll wind up classifying who is a journalist and who isn't? Well, and I think that has been one of the holdups in, in getting it passed, is, is, the, is defining who is, who is a journalist. Um, and, you know, any, anyone with their own blog site can qualify as a journalist. And, and as I said before, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, you know, I, I know that, that safeguards for the media are, you know, vitally important to what we do, but, you know, these days, who is a journalist? Uh, it's, it's very, it's much tougher to say than it was 20 years ago. That's not an answer, but, but I share your frustration. Jill, you mentioned government pushback, maybe source pushback, but does it ever get to the point where the paper pushes back and says, no, I don't think we should publish this, and then what do you do in that kind of situation? Well, again, with the 2005 story of the NSA, as I said, they, you know, the paper decided to hold that story for 13 months um, because the White House didn't want them to publish it. And as I'd indicated, I think the White House made some, some uh, quite misleading arguments, in some cases just fabrications, to try and get the editors not to publish it. Um, the reporters and even a few of the editors in the story disagreed with that decision. And um, you know, ultimately, we ended up running the story. Uh, the main reason, as I've said publicly before, I think was that my partner, Jim, uh, was, was basically going to put the put the story in a book that he was writing. So the paper um, went, went back and looked at the decision and we did some more reporting and they got comfortable enough with it to put it in the newspaper. Um, but you know, that was a fairly um, courageous stand that, that Jim took, some might say reckless, uh, but um, you know, had he not done that, the story probably never would have run. Yes? Wonder. I'm just wondering whether there's a specific process used for classifying information or whether it's rather ad hoc. What have you discovered? Uh, th th there's certainly a specific procedure. Um, I think the bar is very low as to, as to what it takes to get something classified. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's a whole system both for classifying and then declassifying under FOIA reviews, um, uh, especially within, within uh, you know, intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies. Um, it's gotten, I'd say, a little bit better the last few years. I think they are more willing to entertain Freedom of Information Act requests and, and consider uh, declassification is sort of separate from the FOIA process, but they kind of operate on dual tracks. They've gotten a little bit better, but not much. Yes. We know that the American public is very uh, cynical about government, but when it comes to national security, public opinion overwhelmingly supports the government in these arguments over exposing national security secrets. Even though we've seen a pattern going back to McCarthy where there has been huge recorded abuses by government hiding behind national security as its reason to keep something secret. Yet we also know, and we can just go back to 9-11, I can't think of a single concrete case where media have exposed any kind of national security secret that has resulted in a concrete breach of national security costing the lives of anyone. Mm -hmm. If you can think of one, tell me. So my question is, how can we reverse public opinion to show that our watchdog role is protecting the interests of the American public and not in almost every case where we've had these conflicts with government, not 
through government national security secrets, but hiding political embarrassment? Well, to start with, I, I'm not sure that the, the public reaction is, is as overwhelmingly negative as, as you're suggesting. I have to look at some of the more recent polls. But I mean, I think there is a, is a fairly strong contingent um, that, that supports what we're doing. Um, is a minority? Yeah, it's probably a minority. I'm not sure it's, it's you know, overwhelmingly against us on that score. But I, you know, the, the, the best way is just to, to do good journalism. I mean, that sounds overly simplistic, but um, you know, just to continue doing stories that, that attract notice and, and uh, provoke debate. And I think, um, you know, let the work stand for itself. I mean, you know, there's some um, contingent out there that's gonna blast us no matter what. Um, no matter what, what we report and, and how abusive or corrupt or, or uh, mismanaged the story, the, the, what we're reporting on is, they're gonna say we shouldn't print that and you know, we're never gonna convince them. Yes. Um, once something has been classified and you have filed a freedom of information request to receive it and then that's been refused, is there any appeal uh, yes, yes, there, there, there's, a, uh, there's a whole protracted appeals process. Uh, you get the lawyers involved and, and you, uh, when, they, when they deny it, a, a FOIA request, they have to give specific codes as to why they're doing it. Um, and, you know, we can then contest that. Uh, we, we've had limited success. Some groups have had more success than we have, to be honest, in getting stuff declassified. Uh, but a lot of the stuff from Guantanamo Bay and internal records there uh, were the result of, of litigation by, uh, I think it was the ACLU actually, that, that, um, that, that brought Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, so so there, ha there have been some success stories, yes. Oh. I kind of have a, a of a ridiculous speculative question for you. Go for it. Uh, there was a quote by Donald Rumsfeld a long time ago about the things we, we know we don't know and then right. there are things we don't the know we don't know. And the so knows, yeah. in thinking about um, the things that we've learned in the last decade about uh, national security issues that the government didn't want us to know about, what kinds of things do you think are out there that we don't know about yet that, that reporters are trying to tell us about? The, the unknown unknowns, yeah. in other words? Yeah. Uh, you know, they're sending uh, little green men to uh, abduct our, our children. Um, uh, that's a good question. I guess if I knew, I'd have to kill you. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, th that the the surveillance state is probably even even bigger and even more sophisticated than than we realize. People have become sort of numb to it because there have been so many stories out the last year about, you know, various uh, things that they can uh, things that the NSA is capable of doing. But I think it's probably even bigger than we realize. Um, I, I I think that certainly some of the things that were done after 9/11 in the name of national security in those first two or three years, I think there there are probably a whole host of abuses that we do not know about, um, and some of those are probably in the, the torture report that I mentioned, which is still still classified. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of you know totally separate areas, um, I, I guess I guess if I knew, I'd be reporting it. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 you know, I'm sure there's other there's got to be other stuff out there that that we only find out about, you know, years and years down the road, and that's the way. That's the way modern history works. You know, we, we find out about you know J. Edgar Hoover stuff years later. We find out about uh, you know the Pentagon Papers you know years after the, the contents are, are written. So um, you know, unfortunately, we, it's tough to find this stuff out in real time. Yes, I'm curious about the actual kind of transaction that occurs between you and sources if you're dealing with classified information such as the information that you've gotten more than once. Do you very explicitly talk with a source about um, what kind of promise you're making to never reveal the identity of the source? Is it understood? And even if there were a shield law, most shield laws have qualifications of sure. some kind or another. Um, do you think shield laws would really make that much difference in typical relationships with 
with sources. Are journalists going to promise, I'm going to protect you no matter what, and it's not going to really matter if the government has a compelling interest and it doesn't have any other way of getting information or um, whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you try and be as explicit as you can, especially when you're dealing with, with very sensitive information with the source as to, as to what the nature of the relationship is, you know, laying out the ground rules, whether something, um, you know, can, can be printed but without a name attached to it, uh, you know, which is what we call ba background information. You know, if something is off the record, people have different definitions of what off the record means. And uh, you know, you, you you give the person the usually the or always the, the basic assurance that that you're not going to reveal their identity if, they, if that's the if if this is is off the record or on background depending on the situation, you know, you give them that assurance. And would would the shield law protect you? Um, you know, it's not it's not foolproof as as you say, uh, but it's certainly more protection than we have now, which is next to none. So it's it's. Would would you reveal the? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess I'd have to think through the scenario, but no, I don't think so. I think just because they check the boxes on the shield law, I, I think you, you use it as best you, you you know you get the most out of it as you can. But there might be a point where you still have to say no. I'm not going to not going to reveal the source. Um, you know, there have been a few sort of rare cases where you you. Where people have negotiated sort of uh, ex post facto arrangements with the source, where where that person doesn't mind being outed. Um, uh, you know, the most famous actually was was Bob Woodward and Deep Throat, where he where he went to him to uh, what's his name to Mark Felt uh, afterwards, um, j just a few years before he died, and and said, you know, can can we discuss this for history's sake? That's sort of the the, the most historic example. But you know that that happens from time to time. I mean, when I when I wrote my book which talked about some of the NSA stuff. I went back to one or two sources and said, you know, can I, without using a name, can I use this information on sort of a, a, a looser um, arrangement than we have when we first talked? You know, it's, it's not set in stone what your understanding is. You, you, you I don't mean that, it, I mean that the understanding can change over time as long as it's agreed upon by both sides. Yes. Hi. I'm uh, wondering if your work, national security reporting, has been affected by our constriction in the media business, uh, vis a vis getting involved in protracted legal fights. Have, have you got uh, uh, constrictions that? in the what business? I well, the, the media business. In the media, okay. You know, the financial a downturn for us, sort of internally and then the recession in general. But any pressure to not get in, or any sense of not get into protracted legal fights, uh, costly legal fights because of that? No, we, we haven't felt that. I mean, you know, certainly the. the uh, the financial pressures are, you know, are very real, but it hasn't translated into, you know, don't go into certain areas because we might end up in a lawsuit. Um, you know, luckily, we, I haven't felt that. I mean, you know, the New York Times is in a uh, somewhat better financial situation than, than other papers and news organizations, but luckily we haven't felt that. We've got time for one more question, and I'm going to hand the mic over here. Thank you, uh, Eric. Thank you so much for what you do. I, I follow your work very closely. I thank think you. that you and other national security reporters are, are really doing the hardest job in journalism. So I, I want to make sure that we express that. It's, it's really important what you do. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, my question is, is uh, it's related to an argument that's been made since the Snowden disclosures. Um, Professor Henry Farrell, George Washington in particular, has made this point that, and you touched on it a little bit when you said most of the time or much of the time when the government says don't publish the story, we eventually find out that it's not really for legitimate national security reasons, it's to protect against embarrassment or, right. or and, and the crux of that fact is that there's a very big gap between what the United States says it believes in and says it's about and what it ends up doing. And um, Farrell's argument was that given how many secrets there are now, the enormous expansion of classified material, given how many people have clearances and are working in the surveillance state, 
Um, given how easy it is for digital secrets to be transported and published, as you said, without even the press being involved, that there isn't a way to get that cover back on the jar, and that instead the solution is going to have to come from narrowing the gap between word and deed, between what the United States says it is doing and what it is actually doing so that if secrets come out, they aren't that damaging because right. there isn't that much hypocrisy to be revealed. In other words, there'd be fewer secrets. Fewer, <laughs> because yeah, what fewer we say secrets is closer to what we do. And, yeah. few, and less damaging secrets yeah. because they're not exposing something that is so utterly contrary to American values and American rhetoric. Right? So I just wondered what you thought of that argument. I, I hadn't heard that there. That's certainly an interesting idea. I guess that that's looking at government uh, theoretically in its, in its best form, where certainly, there, obviously, there are secrets that have to be kept there, you, you know, to, to run a country, uh, to run a world superpower. Um, but it would be nice to think that, that uh, you know, you didn't have public officials who were just out and out lying to the public, as has happened over and over again. I think, again, going back to the AP story, you know, I think that the, the what they said publicly about this guy in Iran was completely at odds with, uh, with what they knew privately, um, you know, in a case like like Snowden, you had you had James Clapper, uh, the director of national intelligence, you know, telling a, a, a sworn testimony before a congressional panel that they, did, in effect, did not collect bulk records on Americans, you know, just out and out lying. Uh, that was a case where where they've acknowledged since then that yeah, we probably should have just told people uh, to begin with what we were doing. Uh, which is so obvious, you just wonder what they were thinking in those back rooms, you know. Um, because if the, you know, it's, it's in, inevitably the, the secrecy is almost worse than the substance. Um, if they had just been more upfront about the fact, yeah, we're, we're gathering all these phone records, you know, and this is how we're using them, there wouldn't be, have been, there would have been some pushback, certainly, but not nearly the backlash there was as a result that this has been kept secret for so long. Um, so I think that's an interesting, you know, interesting theory. I'm not sure that would ever actually happen, but, <laughs> but um, I know you've been waiting. We can, do you want to take one more? Oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah, um, I came in late, so I don't know if you uh, may have covered this or not. I was wondering if you could comment on the case of John Kiriakos, uh, the CIA employee who allegedly gave information to a journalist, even though the journalist did not publish that information, yet he got a very inordinate prison sentence. Right, right. I did. I touched on that a little bit, not by name. That's the case that Scott Shane, my colleague, uh, got involved in along with a few other reporters. Um, that was an odd one where, where I wasn't directly involved in that, but it did, you know, he got a prison sentence, I think, of two or three years, something like that. I mean, 30 months. 30 months, yeah. Uh, you know, seemed like a, a fairly severe punishment, <laughs> considering the, the circumstances that he was, you know, in effect, maybe confirming information the reporter, reporter already had. And um, it, but it, it goes to as, as I was talking about earlier, just the aggressiveness with which they're going after these these leak investigations with Kiriako, with, with Tom Drake, where the case collapsed, uh, with um, uh, several others. So they, they you know, they've. They're really clamping down, and, and we pay the price. So. Thank you.